In this clip, I want you to think about what I call geographical containers for data. So we're starting to think about how we can overlay data or values about certain phenomena. Think of income, think of poverty, think of um, population density, think of any variable you're interested. And we're starting to think about how we're overlaying that information on top of a geographical canvas. The way this typically is done is by assigning specific values to the geographical regions or areas to which those values represent. Now, what I want to do in this clip is getting you to think a little bit about how do we think about those, those geographical containers, those geographical areas, those delineations that we use to partition the geographical space into a uh, a way that we can use it to assign values or measurements of certain phenomena. And in particular, what I really want you to think about is what are the implicit decisions, the implicit choices that we're making every time that we make this map, a map like this. And I want you to do this because this is going to become pretty much the bread and butter of a lot of what we're doing or what we're going to do in this course. We're going to use data maps or thematic maps, or as we'll see them later, choroplets, in a lot of context for understanding data, for exploring data, for presenting results of some of the analytics that we'll see later. So let's jump on the slides and talk a little bit more about this idea of geographical containers. In particular, what we're really going to talk about and what I would like to bring your attention to is this term that you may or may not have heard, but that after this clip, I would like everyone to be very, very aware of it. And it's the one uh, of the modifiable aerial unit problem or MAUP, which is, it's a ghost, if you wish, that chases every quantitative geographer that tries to map quantitative data on, on ge onto geographies. The term was coined by a professor called Stan Openshaw in the uh, early 80s. Um, and Openshaw was, is a British geographer. So this is something that will probably be recurrent. And if you read uh, more about a quantitative display of, of information over maps, this will come up fairly often. The best way I have to explain and convey the intuition behind the modifiable aerial unit problem is through an illustration. So let's get through the illustration first, and then we'll, uh, we'll reflect a little bit on what it is and what it means and how you can deal with that. You can't necessarily solve it, but at least it's very important that you're aware of it. So let's go with the illustration. Now, let's imagine that we have a, geo uh, a data set here. In this case, it's a data set of points for which we have um, their location and we have some, uh, well, we have their location, okay? So you can think of these points as people and in this case, we would have a data set of population or you can think of these points as different trees and you could, uh, you would be putting yourself into the boots of, a, of an ecologist that is looking at species distribution, for example, or you can think of these points as locations of firms, which is something that economic geographers do very often, or any other entity that, that helps you with the illustration. This is a map of what I would call the real world, the, the true generating process. Okay, so this is how things are in reality. What we're looking at, whether it's people or trees or firms, in this case, they're individuals. Okay, however, and we've seen this in other parts of the course, we don't always get the luxury of getting a data set of the individual entities that make up the process that we're interested in. We don't always get a map or a data set of individual people or of, of individual trees or individual firms. Instead, what we get is data sets that are somewhat aggregated. And whenever I say aggregated, what I mean is that we have invented an ancillary or an auxiliary geography. And what we have done is assigning each of these observations, each of these uh, entities, whether they're people, trees, firms, or whatever, into each of these polygons or these areas or zones. And then usually we count. In this case, let's imagine that we're counting. So imagine that we have this auxiliary geography with four large polygons, 
And then if we want to represent them, say in this case on a map, but if we were doing any uh, more advanced statistics, the, the, the same principle would hold, uh, we would come up with a map like this, where we've counted how many points there are in every polygon, and then we're encoding those counts into a, a color. In this case, we're giving it a gradient. We'll discover more when we talk about uh, choroplets. We're giving it a gradient by which darker colors uh, signify higher counts and lower colors or brighter colors signify uh, lower counts. So this is uh, scenario one. Now let's move on to scenario two, where we have the exact same underlying geography. So I've not changed the the true underlying data set, but instead what we're changing now is the geography. So instead of four polygons, what we have is a much uh, more fine-grained um, set of areas. So smaller areas that give us more uh, resolution. Okay, And then if we were to make the map, so to count how many points there are per uh, polygon, and then encode that into um, a gradient, we would come up with a map like this. Okay, and let's move on to the final case where again we start with exactly the same data set, but in this case we're very lucky and we happen to have a geography that is super fine-grained in space. So it gives us a lot of granularity, it gives us a lot of small areas, okay? This means that we can uh, get more insight into the spatial distribution of these points and when we make a map, what happens is is this. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I want to make very clear that in this case, for this illustration, we do have the original data set, okay? We're, we're looking at this. But in most cases, the only way in which we look at the process or the phenomenon we're interested in, whether it's population density or species distribution or firm location, is not through this. We never get to see this world. All we see is the world through the lenses of the geography through which it, the data is aggregated. In most cases, at least traditionally, this choice of geography is not up to us. It's usually up to the Census Bureau, the Office for Statistics, or whoever is generating and releasing the data. So what we end up with is that with this very simple example that we've seen, we can have three fairly different pictures of the world. And if we never get to see the original data set, but instead we only see one of these three, we can get into pretty severe distortions or we can at least end up concluding very different things. So while in this map you would only be able to say that maybe there is a concentration, say, in the northwest or in the southeast, if these were... Um, geographic, geographically aligned with the four cardinalities. In this one, we're able to see that actually most of the concentrations or the bigger concentrations seem to be much more in the center. So this is a quick illustration of what the modifiable aerial unit problem is, the MAUP, which is really at its core, it's a problem of scale and delineation mismatch is, is a case where either through the scale at which we're looking at the, the data we're interested in or how we are delineating the geography we use to aggregate the data or both, there is a mismatch between the outcome that we end up seeing and the true underlying data set that we're interested in. So it's a mismatch between the underlying process, in our case, individuals, firms, trees, shops, if we were looking at retail, etc., and the unit of measurement that we we use, right? That we are in which we are given the data aggregated at, whether this is neighborhoods, like in the uh, last map it could have been, or regions, or or countries, for example. The key thing with the MAUP, this is not something that we can get rid of necessarily, particularly if we don't have access to the underlying data. The problem is that it can seriously mislead the analysis that we do on the aggregated data. And remember that in many cases, the aggregated data is the only way we have to look at the real world, right? We usually don't get the luxury of looking at the individual data.
So it's something that if if we can't fix because we can't get access to the underlying data, at least it's something we need to be very, very aware of. And when we're drawing conclusions, really, we need to keep the MAUP in mind when we explore data and when we draw conclusions. And we always need to remember that any conclusions or any insights that we derive from a data set that is provided at an aggregated geography may be suffering from the MAUP. And in some cases, we can solve it by trying to get in at the underlying data. In some cases, we, we can't, and we just have to live with this. 